Okay. We're we're having a bunch of wonderful speakers now uh, where we will talk about these both these missing data. So the quantitative stuff. Uh, but also new platforms that have been formed, spaces, which are hugely important. The offline space where we actually come together uh, and gather and uh, be together. Wow, I should be a poet. Um, so the missing data and the new platforms. We'll have a list of uh, speakers uh, going one by one, and after that, We'll uh, join them together also in a, in a quick, quick Q&A, right? To uh, uh, have, a, have a bit of a panel, a bit of a talk. Um, so I'll introduce uh, all of the names uh, for you now. Um, first of all, online, she's not with us physically, but in spirit, no, uh, for sure. It's Agnes Stau, who's a senior civil servant for equality, diversity, in the fight against discrimination. Um, uh, at the Department of uh, um, uh, from, uh, the Ministry of Culture in France. And uh, Agnes um, speaks in French, it's been translated by you, right? Uh, we're very curious to hear about her um, um, yeah, experiences, basically, that have also been, uh, I think, an inspiration, a source of inspiration for, for the group that's been convening this. Um, Galit Elat will uh, speak uh, uh, as well, who's a curator and a researcher. Um, her text is on the lobotomized museum, really cool title. Um, the art object and its context. Uh, really looking forward to that uh, as well. And of course, Pauline Salet, who's an independent researcher um, who um, has worked on these quantitative data and will share her notes with us. Very important. For the new platform uh, part, Tender Center will speak to us. Yin Yin Wong and Catherine McBride, yay, Rotterdam, um, who have set up this uh, space um, in Rotterdam, uh, which is, I think, hugely important. Um, and um, I will definitely come and, and, and have a look. Uh, would be amazing. Naomi Peter, unfortunately, cannot be with us, but her presentation will be uh, written, uh, read by uh, Dauphine. And then we'll have our Q&A. So I, let's start with Agnes Stahl's um, interview. I'm going to present quickly uh, the roadmap uh, equality in France, which I think is a very, as I said earlier, important point of reference. Also because they created an observatory uh, for uh, since 2006 to gather uh, uh, data, and there is a monitoring of this data, and out of the analysis of this uh, monitoring came this policy and this roadmap. So she considers it's a very important uh, uh, tool. Of course, the collection uh, of data, and especially today, uh, is a very uh, sensitive uh, tool. Uh, we could uh, recall here, one is to recall uh, event uh, with uh, Willem Sandberg, who was a director of uh, the um, Stedelijk Museum, and during World War II was also part of a resistance network. And that network uh, tried to uh, blow, uh, need not try, did blow up uh, the Borol King's Register in Amsterdam, uh, so uh, data about the Jewish Polish, uh, com uh, population could not be collected. So it, I it has this very, uh, you know, uh, 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 painful, difficult uh, 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 ground also. Uh, it, it's, it's complex uh, issues. So um, I'm going to uh, present the phone conversation. It's 10 minutes. Uh, I uh, quickly translated it in English so you can read, and for others who speak French, you can follow in French. Um, so I ask a, a, a few questions. Uh, so why a roadmap? Um, uh, what uh, is the impact of the roadmap? Uh, uh, the role of uh, uh, data and uh, quotas, and uh, also uh, uh, the roadmap, uh, could it be a European model? So I remove the question, you will just have the conversation and the text. I'm going to play it now. 
Bonjour Delphine, je suis très heureuse de participer à, cette, à ce moment, à cet échange, à distance malheureusement, mais je vais malgré tout essayer de répondre au mieux aux questions, aux interrogations que vous vous posez en donnant quelques éléments d'une expérience euh, française qui pourra peut-être inspirer euh, d'autres euh, initiatives qui me semblent éminemment souhaitables à l'échelle européenne. En réalité, le ministère de la Culture se pose la question de l'égalité femmes-hommes depuis un certain nombre d'années et on peut se dire peut-être que le point de départ de cette prise de conscience a été constitué par des rapports euh, élaborés par Ren Pratt qui a, dans les années 2006-2008, réalisé des études tout à fait fouillées sur la présence, ou plutôt sur l'absence, des femmes dans les institutions culturelles. Ça a marqué les esprits, bien entendu, parce que le constat était sévère. En revanche, le, tour, le vrai tournant s'est opéré d'abord quand Aurélie Filippetti est devenue ministre de la, de la Culture oui. en 2012. Il y a eu la mise en place d'un observatoire de l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes dans la culture et la communication qui est devenu un document extrêmement euh, consulté, très reconnu, parce que recensant de manière statistique euh, précise la, la situation de l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes dans la totalité des champs euh, de la culture, du cinéma, de l'audiovisuel, de l'administration du ministère et de ses établissements, dans le, le journalisme, le, le, la presse, les arts visuels, etc. Et cette euh, publication annuelle qui, est maintenant, qui va arriver en 2020 à sa huitième euh, édition, sert de référence, d'une part parce qu'elle est très complète, et d'autre part parce que l'évolution qu'elle permet de mesurer montre, et c'est quand même un constat accablant, que les progrès, c'est pourquoi, au-delà de cette euh, mise en place d'outils de mesure qui sont évidemment indispensables pour documenter la matière, euh, il a été considéré comme indispensable de passer à une autre étape, et j'en arrive à notre feuille de route, égalité, oui. que euh, Françoise Nissen, euh, ministre de la Culture, donc, en 2017, a souhaité rendre beaucoup plus volontariste, beaucoup plus ambitieuse, beaucoup plus déterminée que précédemment. Donc, j'ai travaillé avec, avec elle à ce nouveau document. La feuille de route, égalité, est désormais pluriannuelle. Elle ne couvre pas simplement un exercice, mais plusieurs années, donc d'abord ça a été une feuille de route 2018-2022, couvrant le quinquennat, pourquoi Parce que le président Macron a décidé de faire de l'égalité femmes-hommes une grande cause de ces cinq années de son, de son quinquennat, ou de son premier quinquennat, euh, et donc il s'est agi pour nous de rentrer dans cette priorité gouvernementale et de l'incarner par notre feuille de route pluriannuelle, et la feuille de route dans sa deuxième euh, édition, à, couvre désormais les, les années 2019-2022. Et nous allons préparer très vite un, nouvel, un nouveau document qui couvrira cette fois les années 2020-2022. C'est important parce que c'est un document qui a une portée politique dans la mesure où c'est le ministre ou la ministre de la Culture qui le présente devant un comité ministériel qui se réunit une fois par an avec beaucoup de personnalités qualifiées extérieur, des responsables d'établissements publics, etc., etc., et qu'il trace finalement ce document, la, la route, et il indique les chantiers déjà engagés pour améliorer euh, l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes dans l'ensemble du champ des politiques culturelles, mais il indique également, euh, ce n'est pas simplement un bilan, mais ce sont également des perspectives d'action, de, de nouveaux chantiers à ouvrir, de nouvelles actions à mener, donc l'objectif de la feuille de route, si vous voulez, c'est vraiment de constituer un outil extrêmement opérationnel, oui. fixant des axes d'amélioration, amélioration continue, et euh, indiquant également les moyens d'action, les leviers qui sont à notre disposition, et la manière dont nous allons atteindre les objectifs et dont nous allons mesurer et évaluer les résultats. C'est en cela, si vous voulez, que la feuille de route, pour moi, est un élément politiquement très important, oui. et qui également me semble, me semble, encore une fois avec une grande, une grande modestie, mais qui me semble transposable, le cas échéant, à d'autres expériences à l'échelle européenne, 
puisque finalement, on part d'un constat, oui. une situation existante, qui en général n'est pas vraiment bonne, en tout cas, c'est le cas en France, c'est pas, pas brillant encore, il n'y a aucun domaine qui euh, se distingue par son excellence, loin de là, du point de vue des l'égalité, et on se dit, voilà, comment faire pour faire davantage, pour aller plus loin, et pour améliorer la, la, la situation. Parce que, si vous voulez, le recours au quota est une solution à laquelle on parvient tout simplement en tirant les conséquences d'années, voire de décennies, où la situation, comme je l'indiquais tout à l'heure, ne s'est absolument pas améliorée spontanément. Dans un certain nombre de, de, de champs politiques, euh, économiques, quand on a imposé une, un nombre, une égalité ou au moins un équilibre dans les... Euh, conseil d'administration des sociétés du CAC 40, là, on a vu un basculement. Quand on a imposé une parité sur les listes de candidats aux élections, on a vu, mesuré, quantifié un résultat. On a décidé, et là, ça, ça, ça se met en place maintenant, de demander une progression dans la place des femmes, dans les programmations de ces institutions, dans un centre d'art, combien de femmes, euh, de, combien d'expositions d'œuvres de femmes sont programmées, dans une institution de, de musique, de danse, de théâtre, combien de femmes apparaissent en tant qu'autrices, compositrices, chorégraphes, metteuses en scène, sur les postes techniques aussi oui. importants. Sur trois ans, on va mesurer cette progression que nous souhaitons, avec les objectifs que je vous indiquais tout à l'heure d'amélioration, de, 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 et au terme des trois ans, on verra si les résultats sont atteints, est-ce qu'il y aura un bonus financier sur la subvention allouée à l'institution Si les résultats ne sont pas atteints, est-ce qu'il y aura un malus, c'est-à-dire une diminution de la subvention versée On verra, on verra également en termes politiques quel type de, de sanctions positives ou négatives on doit euh, appliquer. Beaucoup de choses, beaucoup de choses parce que c'est un fléau, le harcèlement sexuel et sexiste, les violences, les agissements sexistes qui concernent, bien entendu, la totalité des secteurs, pas seulement les secteurs de la culture, du cinéma, de l'audiovisuel, de la presse, du jeu vidéo, etc. On le sait bien. Oui. Nous sommes, nous, responsables de ce secteur, et c'est là-dessus que nous devons agir. Et nous savons, parce que maintenant, nous avons mis en place à la fois un engagement politique très fort de tolérance zéro à l'égard de ces, de ces comportements, et parce que nous avons pris, au sein même du ministère, des mesures très fortes avec la mise en place d'une cellule euh, d'alerte et de signalement des euh, discriminations en général et des violences et du harcèlement sexuel et sexiste en particulier, on a mis en place une action de formation, de sensibilisation et de formation pour identifier ces comportements et pour indiquer comment faire, comment réagir, vers qui se tourner et pour l'encadrement comment agir face à ce genre de, de situation. Donc maintenant, nous sommes enfin, enfin outillés pour lutter contre. Et donc, à partir du moment où nous avons posé cet objectif d'éradication de ces comportements, nous, les, nous le déclinons, l'objectif, dans l'ensemble du champ des politiques culturelles, des établissements d'enseignement supérieur culture qui dépendent du ministère de la Culture, les écoles d'art, les écoles d'architecture, les conservatoires nationaux, euh, la FEMIS, l'Institut national du patrimoine. Donc toute la liste des établissements sont concernés. On leur a demandé d'élaborer chacun une charte égalité au oui. sein de laquelle on leur demande de prendre des engagements très précis, très fermes, et on leur met à disposition les outils, la cellule d'alerte, la formation, des fiches de procédure, pour faire en sorte que agissements et violences euh, sexuelles harcèlement sexuel et sexiste, soit absolument proscrit et, euh, et sanctionné. Pour dire que je suis évidemment, évidemment, à la disposition de toutes celles, de tous ceux qui, le cas échéant, voudraient euh, transposer l'expérience de notre action en faveur de l'égalité femmes-hommes en France à d'autres euh, contextes euh, géographiques, euh, politiques, euh, sociaux, que sais-je, parce que l'ambition, évidemment, c'est de faire en sorte qu'à l'échelle européenne, même s'il y a déjà d'autres pays qui sont extrêmement avancés, extrêmement actifs et performants dans les politiques d'égalité, je suis évidemment prête à partager euh, notre expérience avec toutes celles et tous ceux qui le souhaiteront.
So it's an open call for Agnes to contact her and reach out. Uh, so we wish we had similar policies here, I guess, but we will come back to this in the panel. And I would like to invite now our next uh, speaker, um, Gali. Um, good morning, good, yeah, good morning. Um, yeah, I'm hap very happy to talk. I, I think it's the first time that I'm talking about uh, this um, in the Netherlands. Um, so it's quite funny, it's 10 years past, I think less than 10 years from uh, the project that I did for the Banabe. Um, it was to end of 2010. Um, um, it was part of play uh, for exhibition that were supposed to construct the how to deal with the collection. Um, I was asked to replace a colleague. Basically, this is how I entered the museum. Uh, she was on maternity leave, and I asked to replace her and to work under the title that was already uh, given and it's the politics of uh, collecting, the collecting of politics. So um, I took it to the way that I could interpret it. Um, maybe it's important to say that I used to work more with archives than in collection. And um, working in the museum, there is uh, quite, I think, a clear definition besides who doing what, the, um, uh, the collection has the market value or the insurance value. The archive will have only the symbolic value, and I think this is something that is quite clear, the division between them, and why there is division today, there is less, but it was a division and uh, that made, so I will talk about one project there, and I will open it a bit to what's happening today. Um, to work with the museum collection, I had to learn the museum collection, but I didn't have time, and I'm not used to work with something that I don't have much information and I was interested to work with the collection and not with um, autonomous art, with one artist, because the way that most of the museum talk about their collection, they talk about certain artists, uh, that the value, uh, Picasso for example, um, valued the collection or, or validated the collection and I was less interested uh, so, um, in compare, I, I invite artists that are working with collection or with archive, but it's not a collection of their works and not archives of the works. So they're working with material, and this is I wanted to compare with the way that the museum is working. Um, so I will go briefly just to give the context, and then I will uh, go to the statistic that I um, did ten, 10 years ago. Uh, so it was like the personal uh, view on historical moment, uh, artist collection and institution, uh, institutional collection. Um, it was about, uh, many discussion asked me like why artists doing the collection, like why they have an archive. And I think now, especially with the black archive, it's much more clear to others you create an archive when you don't have an history. When you need to construct your history or you want to fetch and to identify yourself, you start to construct an archive. And this is a process that I was familiar from, uh, from Palestine, uh, from, from Lebanon, but also from East of Europe after the, uh, um, um, the, the uh, Soviet occupation ended. So in Poland, many other places, it was a moment of um, <laughs> acceleration to uh, who will create the canon, because the canon that was during the Soviet time was not good enough for the time that the post-Soviet uh, time. So I show the work of Akram Zatari. I believe that today everybody knows his work with the Arab Image Foundation, that it's in, in Lebanon, that he worked with the material and read them. Um, I invited a camp. It was the first presentation of the future Palestinian collection that's collected by Al Mamal Foundation uh, in Jerusalem for the museum that become the National Museum of Palestine. So there was list of work, but the work never uh, maintained. So the offer that the museum now uh, maintain the works, which are and Kukulik that work in uh, in, in Poland, uh, and Schneider, and you know it was several thing. Michal Hyman that working with uh, a psychological test, and this is Zondi that she also enacted in the museum, 
and Freud, for example, here, why Freud uh, talked about Anna Ho, and always it was that she abused by her uncle, and close to his death, he confessed that it was her father that abused her. So she, um, like, repeating playing or another archive about ghostly knowledge of Hannah Hutzig. So it was different model how artists dealing with, uh, with history and how they construct the stories um, around it. But they also invited to the Becker. They want to read off the work that are not interested and cost them too much money to uh, uh, maintain them. So they made like a kind of survey which work can go to the museum and the rest what to do with them. My offer was let's offer them to the public in the Einhaven and if people like the work, they can take them because it belongs to the people. And this is also one key issue about restitution and about uh, um, decolonizing, etc. In, in the Netherlands, that your collections uh, belong to the people and people are not informed about it. Basically, it's your, the Dutch uh, citizen, it's your pension, it's there. So when it's given to somebody else or it's restitute, it means that you have left your pension. Um, so, so it was like a different, different project and one of them was because the, uh, my disability, I would say, to enter and to work with the collection and say, oh, this artist, this artist, this is the collection. I say, I want to look at the collection as one unit because this is a collection. So what is a collection? Let's ask the collection who you are, what you are, and what you can offer us. At the same time, it was a, a research that made by the Museum Association on uh, work, on the provenance of work from uh, 33, I think, to 45. I offered to show it, and there is a statistic. I will show you just um, very brief. This is like the text and the different years. And, and I think it's quite important because we talk about museum as a safe place. Museum built on looting and stealing. Uh, the, from the... Uh, um, I would say antiquity, to, to the modern museum, the core of the museum was to show the trophies of war and what they could take from others. So we need to be aware when you enter to the museum, most of the museum that we see that open before, after the war, the core of the collection is looted. Um, so here it's, and I think it was the only time, uh, and I don't, I'm not sure that anyone will uh, do it today just to show this is the work that are were asked by the people in the archive in the collection to point out which works are the provenance are they are not satisfied with so there is so you can see koshka and you can see kandinsky and i think kandinsky it's near now in the button and you see picasso that went to palestine and other works and uh, basically it was without the name of the artist and it was the provenance. So people could see what does it mean when uh, somebody look at the provenance and how you um, have a suspicion where you see the missing hand or traveling of the work. So this is, was one of them and this is also articulated in, um, not in the statistic, but in um, uh, classifying. Basically we did classifying the, the work um, by years, by research. And then was as a question. The, I came to the museum, which is um, contemporary, it's international, uh, it's uh, radical, feminist, whatever you want to attribute to the collection. Say, let's ask the collection what it is. So we made a statistic. What you see here, it's a visualization of demographies. Um, and demographies, so the area which is the darker area, it's from where the, the museum has most of the work. So we see uh, America, we see the Netherlands, the Netherlands is the most, but then the West and Africa, it's white. So it's going from white to black. So the work that I were missing in the collection, uh, the museum bought most of the exhibition, like most of the work that came was not part of the collection because it was from Middle East, it was by female, it was all the things that out of, the statistic we didn't see. Okay, what we see now. Now we see the division between male, female, uh, by medium. Uh, and it's organized by decades. I put it in this way because if we go to the photo, you don't see the end. And this is when the first time the Diana, the head of the archive, looking at the outcome of 
uh, the visualization. Because when we talk about statistics, we have the numbers, and the numbers sometimes can be abstract. Even though we understand the 10%, it's less than 90%. But to go over the corridor and to feel it physically that you go and you go, and the line is continuous. So uh, the lower one, um, it's, uh, uh, it, it belongs to a group, and then to female, and then to male. And you see that the female, it's like, I don't know, less than a meter. The male, it's uh, around uh, here, you can see. And it's continue also after the other door. So the whole corridor was one big line of works made by a male artist and by, um, by medium. So the square, the square that you see in the beginning, but the bigger one. So here it was like each one of the medium donate a symbol so we can see and then I will show you how it's looked at in, in the Excel, how, how this is made also. So you can see that certain period of time it was decayed and it's clear the way that the museum talk about the collection is by the directors. So Woody Fuchs collect this kind of art and you know, so each one of them. So we could see uh, who collect what and what decayed and I think it's quite reflect if you study a bit of art sociology so you immediately recognize what you see. It's kind of very good tool especially for uh, the, the one that dealing with uh, the uh, uh, art sociology. I try to mix together to show you at least one table uh, how it works, and I think it's quite clear, yes. Okay, so there is uh, one column that dealing with um, how many works per in pre uh, uh, classification, so by, me by medium. So we have um, audiovisual, we have 17, and then sculpture, 14, Etc. Etc. And then it's going by uh, for male and, and and female, right? Like you have the female and male below here. Here, so you see the the number of works by all. It's uh, uh, two thousand six hundred fourteen. Uh, by male, it's two thousand four hundred twenty seven. By female, one hundred eighty seven. Uh, it was 10 years ago, so they had 10 years. We can look later what was published lately, I think in the end of the year, and to see how and if, if data really or visualization really help to the museum to articulate where uh, I would say the problem is or what kind of very visible. Um, so you can see that uh, you, now you see the decade, so it's quite clear. The 30s, it was uh, three uh, female, five, sorry. Five mil out 60, so altogether 65. Uh, at the 40s, was less in both cases. So, uh, and then, no, sorry, it was the 40s, I'm saying here. The 40s, but the 40s we need to remember, and this is crucial to a museum that opened in 36, that uh, the 40s, it was during the war. So if you didn't know, so during the war, Second World War, the art market flourished in the Netherlands. Everybody were excited about buying works, and if you didn't have money, you bought kitsch. It's a research that's made in uh, Neod, and it's quite interesting to understand that during the war, art became very, very important and crucial uh, asset to have. Also, it was circulating to um, uh, the generate art, which I think it's a spin more than ideology how to circulate in the market, but. Uh, to the collection, to the data. So 50s, again, we have four, even less than the 30s, and then we have more uh, male artists. 60s, it's not better, supposed to be better, but not. Uh, 70s, a bit. 80s, we see the difference, and I think the 2000, uh, like the 1990 to the 2000, it was a 70, it's already like a number, um, but, by 2010, when I did the, the, the statistic, it's, uh, we can see the, the difference in the number, which is, I think, um, devastating. It's less than 10%. Um, I just took, okay, just two minutes, so the one that you just, Dutch can read it, it was later on kind of analyzation of the media. So I took like a few things that, uh, what the people, uh, how they react 
to showing uh, to look at the numbers, to look at the collection as a new a new unit. And um, I think it's it's uh, it's here. It's the insects. It's <laughs> it's, it's disturbing, uh, monstrous, uh, horrible artist in the Vanabe. So uh, I don't think it's a good translation, but. Uh, uh, but it's a, yeah, it's about the, wo the work in the art, and later it's a complaint, and it's, it's a right complaint. Why we don't see the autonomous artist? Because when we talk, it's used, and still it is the way how it's talked about the collection. We have the Lesitsky, we have the biggest collection of Lesitsky inside the collection. So the collection usually portrayed by one, two, or few male artists that they made the collection. So there is the Picasso, Picasso. There is also Chagall, which is much better, uh, I think. In the, but but you can see that it's missing. So people that the critique couldn't get it. Like okay, it was about uh, politics. It was about Middle East. But why we need to see this now? About last thing about data. There is data. There is data. Just it's uh, allocated in different places. All the museum already for a few years digitized most of the works are digitized, not all of them access online to us, to everyone, but they can access. So this is uh, just uh, one page that can show you how much from the um, collection already digitized, and if it digitized, so how much metadata, and if you can't find a gender, so it means that somebody didn't add the metadata to the works. So most of the collection already, uh, for several years, already digitized and continue to be digitized, it needs to be an access and it needs to be analyzed. Without it, we don't have the data, but it's not a problem to do it because it's there. It's just somebody need to work and to um, uh, get the data out of it. That's it. Um, maybe one thing that I prepare, I will just show it and I will encourage you to um, go and read it. It's the culture policy. And one of the things that's interesting in the, again, this, just to open this one. Yeah. Uh, I, I just took a few pages, but one thing which is, uh, I think, um, amazing, that until uh, one year ago, it was no law around the museum. Basically, the museum were autonomous, so whatever, uh, if you want to take a data, if you get the information, they were not fine to give you any information. This is changed last, last year. Those documents are online, and it's the uh, uh, culture policy of the Netherlands. So you can read uh, about how this development, what is the law, what they need to do or must to do according to the EU um, rules. That's it. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. forward um, Pauline Salette. She's a graduate from the Research Master of Gender Studies at Utrecht University. Um, her research uh, focuses, um, here you go with your mic, um, on the intersections of storytelling, representation, literature, and the visual arts with a special interest in museum space spaces. It resulted in a master thesis on the, sh on the share of female artists and representation of women in eight Dutch museums, following the example of uh, the Guerrilla Girls. Give a hand to Pauline Salet. Hello, thank you for having me here. Um, so in, in light of today's topic, I will discuss the research I did in 2018 on the representation of female artists in Dutch museums. This research came into existence when I decided to follow the example of the Guerrilla Girls. Um, so to give you a little bit of context, the Guerrilla Girls are a feminist, activist, and artist group from the United States. And since 1985, uh, this group has highlighted power imbalances, gender inequality, and bias in politics, arts, and popular culture. They do this through a combination of facts and humor. Um, a notable and probably well-known example of this is a yellow and pink poster that shows the image of a naked woman wearing a gorilla mask accompanied by the following question, do women have to be naked to be featured in the Met Museum? So this poster was first spread in 1989 and updated in 2005 and 2012. The one that I've used here is the one from 1980, is a 1989 version 
but the numbers in the updated versions haven't improved much, unfortunately. Um, the poster also shows the percentage of female artists and female nudes featured in the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And whereas 85% of the nudes in this museum are female, only 5% of the artists in the museum are female. This way of addressing our problem is a very simple yet effective way of pointing out power imbalances because it indicates an inequality simply by putting it into numbers. Um, in 2016, the Van Abel Museum in Eindhoven hosted a retrospective of uh, a retrospective a retrospective exhibition of the group, showing their work from the start in 1985 up until 2012. Um, a few years later, in March 2018, the Guerrilla Girls themselves visited the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, as they were they were invited by Mama Cash as part of their annual feminist festival um, on the 8th of March. Um, taking place on International Women's Day. So the Guerrilla Girls are therefore no strangers in Dutch museums. Yet a similar kind of investigation had not been done before, despite its relatively simple research method, um, namely that of counting the number of female and male artists in museums. Um, and I'll come back to that relatively simple later. But this is why for my graduate thesis, I started counting female artists. So between March and June 2018, I visited eight Dutch museums. The Van Abel Museum in Eindhoven, Boymans van Beuningen in Rotterdam, Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, Centraal Museum in Utrecht, Groninger Museum in Groningen, Drents Museum in Assen, Gemeente Museum, which is now, I believe, called the Kunst, Kunst Museum in The Hague, and Museum de Fundatie in Zwolle. These museums were uh, chosen based on prestige and prominence in the Netherlands, also their visitor, visitor numbers and their location in the Netherlands. So combining the collections of all eight museums, these museums show the work of 926 artists, of which 779 uh, are male artists and 124 are female artists. So this translates into 84.1.1% of the artists being male and female artists making up only 13.4% of the total number of artists. Um, I put the focus of this research on individual artists, so le I left out artist collectives and collaborations and such that make up the, make up the other 2.5% of this research. Um, the largest gap was found in Museum de Fundatie where at the time of my research, no female artists were shown at all um, in the collection on display. And the collection consist consisted of the work of 25 male artists. The Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam had the smallest, yet a still significant gap. 75.9% of the art on display was made by male artists, as opposed to 20.5% female artists or 233 men, as opposed to 63 women. Now, apart from these numbers, there are a few other things that, are no that were noteworthy about the collections. The first thing is that male artists were often featured with multiple works of art, whereas female artists often only had one or two pieces on display. As I said before, I counted 926 artists, the top 20 um, of the most frequently shown artists were all men, and there are only three women in the top 50. So this is where it's important to realize that it's not just presence in the museum, but also frequency that matters in what we see. And now the imbalance between male and female artists can be partly explained by what is the museums have available in their overall collections at the time um, of the exhibit, and of course, the exhibition on display is a selection of that. So museums are dependent on what has been collected in past decades. Um, new acquisitions are, of course, expensive, and gaps in collections are not that easily filled, and not that quickly filled with new works of art. So this is a problem that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to deal with. Um, and this is why I also looked into temporary exhibitions, because I believe that that's a space where a museum has a little bit more 
flexibility in terms of what they are able to show. Um, they have a little bit more flexibility in terms of their choices, depending on collaborations and loans from other museums and private collections. Um, and this is why I thought it was worth the effort to take a look at the balance between male and female artists in temporary exhibitions as well. So I looked at who had been a subject in a solo exhibition over the course of five years. Um, between 2013 and 2018, the eight museums that I mentioned before have hosted 341 solo exhibitions, of which 240 featured male artists, uh, as opposed to 102 of female artists. Um, so this results in respectively 70.4% and 29.9%. So looking at the museums individually, most museums do not deviate much from this average of 70 to 75% men and around 30% or less female artists in the temporary exhibitions. Um, however, with 53.3 and four, uh, male artists and 46 0.7 female artists given solo exhibitions, the Van Abbe Museum exceeds this trend. Um, so they show a very positive step towards a goal that they actually explicit, explicitly mention in their policy plans, which is to pay attention to equal representation of both male and female artists. The data show that there's a slight increase in representation of female artists in temporary exhibitions, um, as opposed to the main collections. Here it's 29.9% female artists as opposed to 13.4% overall. Um, um, yeah, although this is slightly more and even though this differs per museum, this is of, of course still nowhere near, near equal representation. And in addition to that, there's only one year where one museum hosted no solo exhibitions by men at all. In contrast, there were four years where we where one or more museums hosted no solo exhibitions by female artists at all. Now, earlier on I spoke about this kind of research being relatively simple, um, seeing as it, it is just a matter of counting. But how simply, simply it can be done, it can actually be debated. Um, counting, uh, counting as a research method has its limits and with that its flaws. And that needs to be addressed as well. The first issue is of course that of categorization. Uh, the need for clearly de demarcated categories that will be counted, which is exactly the categorization in terms of gender and a binary notion about which that, that feminist and feminist intersectional thinking and research seeks to destabilize. So in doing this kind of research, there's some level of upholding this gen gender binary that we work so hard to move away from. In my research, my, um, I limited myself to male and female, and it was not done with some hesitation. Um, but I made this decision to limit the scope of the research and to make it doable in the amount of space and time that was available to me. So this research, too, is limited in its data collection because it exposes sexism but not racism, and it is not sufficient for mapping out any other aspects of identity formation that, um, that might be present in a museum space. Um, and what's more is that these data overlook the artworks themselves, so they are not representative of the ways in which museums deal with these topics of in and exclusion through the art that they show. And of course, the artworks themselves play a significant uh, key role in this too. Where does this leave us? The first thing to think about in general, and maybe today, is how we can work towards a more intersectional approach of data collection. Counting male and female artists categorizes people according to binary notions of gender. While this is useful for exposing hege hegemonic discourses, there's a need for developing tools that incorporate a more intersectional approach towards mapping out inequalities. Because data collection is still something we need and that we can use to our advantage. Even though it is limited, the method of counting can be me a means of gathering evidence and, a and of measuring exclusion in the art world. So it should therefore be regarded as a strategic tool. Um, 
bringing inequality and representation into numbers is a starting point. So the data that I presented here, while being limited, should only be taken as an indication, a sample, um, and a start for f maybe f uh, further research. So because exposing a problem and naming it is the beginning of many steps that can be taken towards museums and any other space for that matter, um, becoming more inclusive spaces and for making inequalities more visible. As I said, this was part of my own research that I did uh, this for my graduation thesis. But after that, that it was included into a larger meta-analysis uh, about women in four art disciplines in the Netherlands. This research was commissioned by Mama Cash, which is a Dutch fund for feminist activism. And I worked on this together with Astrid Kergman, who is present here today as well. This gave us a very clear overview of the problem not being limited to only visual arts or museums, but to a whole number of disciplines in the art world, or in the Dutch art world at least. Um, and this shows that the method of counting taken up by the Guerrilla Girls many years ago um, is still very relevant today um, as a means of creating awareness around mechanisms and processes of in and exclusion. Thank you. Great. Good stuff, Pauline. Uh, thank you for doing that. Really, again, important, viable information. Um, and yes, numbers as a strategic tool. Uh, we'll talk more about it in the panel later on. Uh, and that sort of concludes the first part um, in, in, in the, the missing data uh, conversation. Move.